the infrasternal angle is a representation of so many different things within the body and it gives us a lens and great information on where someone is oriented within their skeleton, what they're good at, what they're potentially not so good at, and how we can fill in the gaps to improve overall movement. Before we get into different presentations of infrasternal angles, I want to go over basic breathing or respiration mechanics because that's going to set the stage for how we understand how these infrasternal angle presentations come to be. So under normal breathing mechanics, what happens is that the diaphragm is going to descend, which creates a pressure gradient change within the rib cage and the thorax as a whole. And we have two different types of ribs. So we have these upper pump handle ribs. And because these have more of a fixated attachment to the sternum itself, these are going to move primarily forward and back, similar to how a pump handle moves. Down below, these are the bucket handle ribs. And these, upon inhalation, swing outward and upon exhalation, downward. And this is where your infrasternal angle is right here. And these ribs are the most pliable or changeable bones in the entire axial skeleton, which is basically your whole skeleton minus your limbs. When we inhale, we're going to get more external rotation in our system as a whole. So this pelvis is going to go into external rotation and flare outwards like this. The femurs will go into relative, very small amounts of external rotation. And then the sacrum bone is gonna tip back to accommodate for that happening. And up top within the rib cage itself, we should see this 360 degree expansion because of that rib cage moving and expanding in all directions. And also the belly should simultaneously rise to a slight extent. And then you're going to see an overall decrease in spinal curves. And we get a little bit more tall when we inhale. As we exhale then, we're going to see more internal rotation of the pelvis, more nutation of the sacrum, the femurs rotating very slightly inwards, and you're going to see an increase in spinal curves as a whole. So this is going to come forward more, and then as these ribs depress upon exhalation, that's going to result in an overall increase in this rounding right here and this arching right here. A wide infrasternal angle is someone that's biased towards an exhaled axial skeleton. So these people have a increase in their spinal curves. They're going to be more exhaled because if you fully exhale, you can feel everything start to come down a little bit more. So these people have more of this nutated or forward sacrum and then these bones rotate inwards into internal rotation and then the femurs can slide back further into internal rotation. They're going to have more lumbar lordosis and thoracic kyphosis or rounding here. And that's because of this exhaled bias. Now, when we inhale, there is actually a much larger cavity on the back called the posterior mediastinal cavity, which is much larger than the anterior one. This is something that a lot of people don't realize is that when we inhale, we need to expand into our back more so than we actually do the front in terms of these cavities. So these wide infrasternal angles have a lot of compression on the back side of their rib cage, which limits their ability to expand the back rib cage. So what they're doing is they're going to seek an inhalation strategy. So what they're going to do is move these ribs, which are very pliable relative to other bones in our bodies. And then that's going to allow them to widen out over time because they're going to push air via the path of least resistance, which is down here. And over time that widens out the infrasternal angle. So you can look at a wide ISA and say, oh, that's, that's wide. So you should have an inhaled presentation, right? An inhaled axial skeleton but really it is reflective of their exhaled axial skeleton and they need to create an inhalation strategy by widening out these bones because it is that path of least resistance. So what you would expect to see is this person present with more internal rotation based measures. So they should have more internal rotation of their hip. Their shoulder will have more internal rotation because even though they have this posterior compression pulling their scapula back, they're going to have a humerus that internally rotates in order to find that internal rotation that they're probably going to be seeking. So because of this bias, they're going to have more internal rotation of their hip, they're going to have more internal rotation of their shoulder, and they're going to see therefore a limitation in many external rotation based measurements, such as shoulder external rotation and flexion and external rotation of the hip and flexion of the hip. But the thing is, is that humans need to move from external rotation to internal rotation, back to external rotation, and so on and so forth. That allows us to move through the gait cycle. That allows us to do so many athletic things. We do this when we squat, when we deadlift, when we do so many different things. So how are we gonna find that external rotation? 
Well, what ends up happening is that these wide and first journal angles are going to create a compensation, an additional layer where they can in order to find what they don't have. So usually what you're going to see is they're going to get a pull from muscles on the front side of the pelvis, such as the AD ductors, which have leverage, especially the ones that attach on the actual pelvis itself to pull it down and forward, which orients the pelvis more forward. But they still need to find external rotation, so their femurs orient outwards into external rotation. You can think about this as if, if you think of someone who's a wide infrasternal angle, they like to sit with their legs out all the time. I'm a wide infrasternal angle personally, and I love to sit with my knees out because that's how my femurs are oriented within their hip sockets themselves. Up top, what you're gonna see is they're going to depress these pump handle ribs, which is going to allow them to increase their thoracic kyphosis. And what you're going to see there is because this pelvis is now forward, they need to depress this in order to come back or it can be vice versa. This is down, which results in them needing to bring this forward so they don't feel like they're falling too far back. Now what you're going to see is that they're going to actually lose internal rotation-based measurements. So you're going to see a reduction in hip internal rotation-based measurements because the more forward you go within your pelvis, if you keep going more and more forward, you lose internal rotation. And you're going to see a reduction in internal rotation within the shoulder itself as well. So now these people might present with more external rotation of the femur itself than internal rotation because that's how they are now oriented in the secondary layer. They also might present with more external rotation of the shoulder. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a narrow infrasternal angle. A narrow infrasternal angle is just the inverse of a wide. So they have an inhaled axial skeleton. They have an inhalation bias. And what's interesting is that their diaphragm is descended. It's stuck in this inhaled state. And as it descends more and more and more, the line of pull of the fibers of the diaphragm start to become relatively more horizontal. And the pressure gradient changes within the abdomen and the thorax and the rib cage, which results in when we inhale, the diaphragm still wants to contract. So it's going to pull the abdomen inward and upward, which is why we often see with narrow ISAs this pooch belly presentation. Whereas a wide ISA would have more of this beer belly presentation because they're just moving things out of the way. But these narrows are seeking an exhalation based strategy. So what they're going to do is they're going to compress the infrasternal angle again because it's easy to move it. And now that's going to allow them to compress from side to side to help squeeze air out because they are inhalation biased. They are going to have more posterior expansion but they're going to have a slight limitation in this anterior rib cage itself. But because we expand here more, they're able to expand their rib cage as a whole more than the wides. Now at their pelvis, because inhalation is more external rotation dominant, they're going to have more counter mutated sacrum where this tips back and these bones flare out to accommodate for that. That allows the femurs to pick up more external rotation, but results in overall more of this flat back presentation. Now, how are these narrow infrasternal angles going to find internal rotation? Well, it's not like they're gonna wake up and roll out of bed one day and have access to internal rotation and mutation of the sacrum and the ability to internally rotate their shoulder really well. What they're going to probably do is get a push from above the level of the pelvis, which is going to push their pelvis as a whole into this anterior pelvic tilt or anterior orientation. But the important thing to remember is that they're still relatively counter -nutated. So they're going to be forward, but they're still going to be in a position of external rotation within their pelvis. It's just now as a whole oriented forward. And that's what's important to remember. So they're going to do that via compressing where they can, which is easy at their back rib cage because there's not a lot of tightness here yet. So as we go forward into this anterior orientation, that allows them to pick up internal rotation of the femurs, but that doesn't mean necessarily they can access it at their pelvis. But because of this orientation forward, they are now orienting their hip sockets down at the floor, which allows them to pick up internal rotation. Now at the back rib cage, because posterior expansion and posterior ribcage positioning is more associated with external rotation and flexion-based measurements of the shoulder, they're going to lose some of that. So they're not gonna have as much external rotation of the shoulder or flexion 
of the shoulder and that's going to be limited. Now we just spent a lot of time discussing how these things came to be, but what can we do to help improve it? What can we do to go about restoring genuine movement and variability? Well, it's important to know that compensations and secondary compensations in particular are reflective of strategies where we are recruiting more muscle closer to the surface of our skin. So we have muscles like our pecs, our lats, our back extensors, quads, hip flexors. These muscles are closer to the surface of the skin, generally speaking, and they are bigger muscles, which help pull us into these positions or push us. So it's like we're stacking layers on top of one another. And in order for us to get to the bottommost layer, we have to cut through the layers of that cake to get to the lowest level or the primary layer. So the primary layer is more these smaller muscles deeper within us and the diaphragm, all of these things, genetics that make us who we are in terms of an infrasternal angle presentation. But in order for us to remove the secondary layer, we need to downregulate the tone of where these compensations are happening. So with a narrow, because they have this compression of the posterior rib cage jamming their pelvis forward, we want to help expand, give them that posterior expansion they should have back first. So by getting them that posterior expansion back, that's going to allow them to bring their pelvis to a more neutral position. And remember, they have this externally rotated pelvis, it's just now forward. If we can bring it back, that will open up space for them to move back into external rotation. And then from there, we can then go about restoring more internal rotation-based measurements. We can begin to expand the front of the ribcage. We can begin to layer on some ability to access internal rotation of the pelvis because they can move from a position of external rotation to genuine internal rotation. As for a wide, we would want to get rid of this compression right here, which is pulling them down and also help bring their pelvis back. So we want to do that via recruiting muscles like the hamstrings and potentially a little bit of the glutes to help rotate that pelvis back, which will help take care of what's happening here. But we also want to expand this because this was compressed in that secondary layer to help open that up. And then we can go about restoring some posterior expansion and giving them some external rotation of their pelvis. So again, they can move from external rotation to internal rotation. In order to avoid making this video an hour long, I am going to link the specific exercises for how we go about resolving these things in the article I am writing alongside this. I will link it down below in the description and it will have many in-depth detailed videos for you to go through. But just some general recommendations, if you're working with more of a primary wide infrasternal angle individual, or you're trying to restore more posterior expansion of the rib cage, a supine position on the back will be better for that because the pressure of gravity pushing down and the viscera dropping and the fluids going down is going to allow for expansion to happen more posteriorly within the rib cage. We can also use sideline positions for a wide infrasternal angle or someone who needs more expansion from front to back in the rib cage because what a sideline position does is we're using gravity to compress them laterally and that's going to allow them to expand from front to back because we have compression here and here but that's gonna open up the space from front to back. And that can be a very advantageous position for someone who is a primary wide or they're a deeply compensatory narrow who needs to get some anterior to posterior rib cage back. If you have more of a primary narrow or someone who needs more anterior expansion, a prone position, such as an all fours position where the hands are underneath the shoulders and the knees are underneath the hips can be a really good position because that will open up the chest via that gravitational influence. In terms of the weight room or more loaded variations, a squat pattern is going to be generally best for wide infrasternal angle individuals or people who need more external rotation because as we move deeper into hip flexion or hip bend, we actually need to go into more external rotation at the end range position, but also at the very top of it before we get to more parallel where that's more internal rotation bias. A hinge position is going to be better for more of a narrow or someone who needs more internal rotation because a hinge position biases that more 90 degrees of hip flexion where we are going to be more internal rotation dominant. And that can be a really good way to load someone and still restore some movement variability and range of motion and joint positions they may be missing. 
Again, if you're looking for specific exercises, check out the article I wrote alongside this, and I linked it in the description below. It's very detailed, there's a lot more visuals, and it should be a really helpful complement to this video. But hopefully this gives you some ideas of how people begin to compensate, and it'll give you a roadmap for understanding how these people tend to get to where they're at. You can imagine a spectrum where you have a big, strong, bulky, powerlifting guy, and a small, narrow-framed, marathon-running female. Generally, bigger guys tend to be more wides, more thin females tend to be more narrows, but ultimately it's just a spectrum. Most people are somewhere in the middle. And it allows us to start with a bias, but we will compensate to find what we don't have. And what's interesting is as we start to compensate more and more and add these layers, we start to look the same. And we start to end up in a very predictable presentation. And there are individual differences, but hopefully this gives you some ideas of where people are at and how they got there and potentially what we can do in the most efficient way possible to restore movement quality.